Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm now going to hand over to John, just making sure I got that right there. Just handing over to John, who's going to talk to you about his self-made eco house. So hands together for John. Hello. So I'm going to have a quick sort of overview, really. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I just thought if you want to ask uh, any more questions, apart from at the end, they'll be, you can come and find me around site somewhere. So um, this is uh, the house I decided to build myself. Um, so um, when me and wife were looking for a house, we decided we wanted actually one with a large garden. We, we had an allotment and we wanted to sort of grow our own vegetables in our own garden. And that sort of progressed a little bit as we started looking, we decided that we might want to have some animals. <laughs> um, so uh, we started looking around for places with a bit of an acre, um, and that sort of snowballed a little bit more. Uh, oh, and yeah. We even thought two acres would be nice, but um, <laughs> we never thought we would afford that. And then um, the the wife being the chief decision decision maker when buying a house, um, we came to this um, what I thought was an ideal opportunity. Um, so it took my wife to look at it. Uh, we had a six six old six months old son at the time, and um, he needed breastfeeding, so she stayed in the car. I had a look round. I decided. That it's going to be a good one. Uh, so I went and bought this without her actually seeing it. <laughs> and um, a little bit of a mess, but uh, bear in mind that this was after a couple of guys had spent a day's work trying to clear the stuff away so you could actually see the house. <laughs> um, and I mean, she, she was in agreement really because we um, always knew the um, to get a couple of acres and a nice house was never going to happen so we were going for a bit of a building plot in some respects so this had a house on it so we were going to be able to rebuild a house there and it was in a um, development boundary of a village as well um, so one of the first priorities we ended up having to do um, <laughs> which was a, an interesting one was um, we had to build a garage first <laughs> which this was actually going to be our, our second uh, priority, we, we were going to build this, but we um, we discovered we had bats in the house, so we had to build them a nice garage first to put the bats into. Um, but this became very useful because I could then store lots of lots of house building stuff in it. Um, so onto the real subject, I suppose. Um, we were uh, we're quite sort of ecologically minded, so we did a bit of looking into what we could do on the eco-friendly house side of things, and. So some of the first things um, when you do searching on this sort of thing is that the, the first golden rule really is to insulate and to put lots more insulation on it and if put even more insulation on it if you can. Because um, insulation is really actually quite cheap and it stops you having any sort of heating bills to any extent really later on. Um, but after, I mean, after you've insulated a lot, you, you start finding that about a third to a half of your heat loss then becomes because air, the, the house leaks air and all, all the warm air escapes from the house. Um, and this is one of the interesting things that builders don't quite understand yet. While they didn't five years ago when we were building the house, that there's a lot of attention to detail and a lot of things I've, I found out about how to make an, a house airtight so you're not losing all your warm air for no real reason. Um, and then we also looked into um, low impact materials. Um, so you'll, you'll see a thing called passive house, which is trying to make a, a low energy house and running. But the, the problem I have with the passive house is it has no idea about how much concrete say you've used and how much of an ecological impact that does on the environment building the house in the first place. So we wanted to do um, build it out of wood mostly because that sort of is carbon negative because you're storing wood because um, CO2 in the walls and not to have any sort of we, we sort of try to avoid aluminium as well because that requires a huge amount of energy to actually process the aluminium in the first place. I mean, one of our other goal, goals was if we're going to go through all this effort of building a house, 
we're never going to move again. So we tried to design one that was going to meet all our future needs to some extent. One of those is just making it a little bigger than you really can afford. So on the um, <laughs> low impact side of things, um, I wanted to do, remove as much as possible any CO2 on the environment and any CO2 used on construction. So that's why we um, avoided aluminium and such. Um, and there was, there was also at the time, I don't seem to think it's so much in the um, press these days, there was this thing called Code for Sustainable Homes that has a load of guidelines on how to go about making a, they were terming it a zero carbon house. The problem we have with a zero carbon house is to really go to that level, you need to generate energy on site somehow. And we have, um, we have too many trees shading our roofs to be able to, our roof to be able to do um, a sol solar power for electricity, which is what the sort of thing wanted it to do. And then when it comes to actually building the house, there's all sorts of material. So, it's, so we went for a timber frame house uh, to do wood for the wooden walls. Um, we uh, used some eco-friendly paint, so all the gloss work and all the normal emulsion in the house is lower impact. So it doesn't contain stuff like titanium di dioxide to make stuff white, because that's uh, quite a bad thing in the environment to make and stuff as well in the first place. And we, we, we tried not to use too much plastic if we could inside the house. Some of that was unavoidable, but um, that's how it goes. So, yeah, I mean, you can watch all these grand design programs and they give you a, an impression that builders may know about some of these new technologies. But if you talk to actual builders, very few watch grand designs or know, and they're all quite a bit um, left field for them. So it's quite difficult to verify a builder. So, I mean, the builders we took to, I mean, grand designs at the time had this idea of CO2 negative concrete, but none of the builders knew anything about it. Um, so there's lots of little battles and that was one of the ones I sort of forewent on really. So I mean we decided on a timber frame house and there's a, once you've got the timber frame up you've got to insulate it, um, so you've got to f in infill the timber frame somewhere. And some of the ones that I found most interesting is uh, a straw bale, but the straw bale's actually a lot of labour to actually put in. <laughs> Um, and you have to go through a lot of effort of finding a farmer who can build you a really tight straw bale in the first place. And because I had a couple of, a young kid at the time and was working um, about an hour's drive away, I, we tried to get a main builder to do, do most of the house for us. Um, so that wasn't really going to work with the straw bale. And the hemcrete as well is a nice, interesting technology, but it's at the time, and it still is, I think, quite, quite new. Um, warm cell is one I hadn't really heard of myself, but my architect um, mentioned it. And that was actually probably a good choice that we went with. Warm cell is, um, they term it recycled newspaper, but I think it's when they have a load of printed newspaper that they don't sell. So it's still in good condition. They sort of mince that up, mix it with a bit of brawn on so it doesn't go mouldy or anything. And they've, get this really sort of fluffy, tightly packed stuff that you can't burn because there's no, there's no air inside it. Um, and the good thing is that it's been on the market for quite a while and so some of the builders we talked to have actually built a house before using it. Um, there's other things. After lots of looking, you can Wooden windows are one of the things that also we chose. Um, initial, initial searching will make you think that wooden windows are a premium product and you have to pay a lot more than a UPVC window. But if you actually look around and find your local timber and your local carpentry or joinery place that can make windows, they can actually do it for a similar price to UPVC. And you can then use um, linseed oil paint, which is a old traditional way to paint your windows. Not, a, not an 80s way of painting your windows that they rot. So if you, if you get to a proper joiner and you linseed oil the paint, each, they, they, they should last uh, about 60 years. 
And the advantage of wooded windows is then they're repairable where UPVC tends to get thrown away. Um, also on the structured insulated panels, um, that's another building technique I looked into. Um, that's where they sort of have these big panels that have got um, plywood or chipboard either side and they've got the UPVR foam um, stuck between them. Um, but the, the foam they stuck between them is not really, wasn't really eco-friendly enough for us. Um, and the eco paint, as I mentioned. Um, so when it comes to powering the house, there's a few things that I, I was looking into about how to create energy and how to um, heat the house in the winter months. Because although you can build a passive house, even the passive house standards, which tries to have a, a minimal footprint as, on the energy side as possible, uh, requires some space heating to some extent. Um, and they tend to have an air ventilation system which has a bit of heating in it. Um, but my concern was with kids really was um, you'd get um, the kids leaving the doors open and cooling the house down too much. So on the, on the energy front of things, we looked at solar power. So that can be your, your normal PV, which is your electric panels that most people are accustomed to. But you can also get thermal things. So you can get a... Um, Two types of thermal panels, which have um, water, which generally you heat up the water in the in the panels. So you have a flat plate one, which um, is the more traditional one, and you have these new ones. Well, they're not that new anymore. The, these new ones called evacuated tube ones, which is a bit like a thermos fast. You have this long tube with a heat pipe in it in a, in a in vacuum, and they were one of the technologies we went to because they work better in the winter and in the spring and autumn times where you get a little bit more energy out of them than the flat panel. Um, we couldn't we have trees overshadowing our south facing roof so we couldn't really use the solar side of things but I'll come on to that. Um, I also looked at wind power. Um, wind power was it gets quite expensive when you want a really big wind turbine and probably starts annoying your neighbours and it was also going to go cause us huge problems because we have bats, so the, the bats weren't going <laughs> to... We probably weren't going to get permission from that. Um, there's also a lot of... Um, if you go to a lot of the self-build type shows, I'll try and push on to these ideas of a ground source heat pump or an air source heat pump. And the problem I have with those is they're quite expensive and that you're really just using electricity still to heat your house. So if you're somewhere where you don't have mains gas, we could have got mains gas if we wanted to. If, if somewhere you've got mains gas, it's probably more environmentally friendly to use mains gas than it is to install your air source heat pump. or your ground, The ground source heat pump's the one where you have a big tube into your garden and you take the heat out of your garden with an electric pump like your fridge, like your, how your fridge works, and pump that into your room. And the air source, the problem I have with the air source ones is they're most efficient in the summer when you don't need it, and they're least efficient when it's really freezing outside and it's cold, and when you actually need the heat. Um, some of the other options we looked into were burning wood, um, and we also uh, did look into mains gas, but we decided not to connect up yet because that was going to cost us four grand. And also, yeah, you could, you could heat your house with um, just using uh, normal mains electricity. Um, so the solar panels, are, as I said, the, the, the PV is not suitable because, as I understand it, you, get, you can have your south-facing roof full of solar panels, but if a tree masks a, just a small 10% of one of those panels, that's it. Your, your efficiency drops right off on your solar panels and you don't really make much electricity. Um, I believe now there are little inverters so you can, power, so you can take the harvest of power from one panel at a time. But at the time when I was looking into it, that, that was a new technology that wasn't quite released. Um, so the flat panels, as I said, are the sort of traditional bit like a black radiator where the whole um, thing has just got water in it. And so that, that is affected more by the cold weather than the um, evacuated tubes. And yeah, so the, the path is, 
on on the actual heating is that the passive house will you still need hot water people still expect hot water to be there available every day of the year so even even a passive house you need to heat your water somehow and for us and especially living living into it we, we find the space heating between november and february is when we start thinking about whether we need to heat our house a bit or not outside those months it's just we don't care we just don't think about whether we've got enough heat or water to some extent and we have a couple of the kids now so they they run in and out of the house and don't close the doors and stuff so if we went for the whole path is half house problem i think if we didn't have actually some proper heating behind it we may struggle so on ah no i can't see that um so in the end i went with a um a thing called a st- thermal store. So a um, thermal store is sort of best sought out as a large hot water tank, but in reverse. So instead of using the water in the tank, the water in the tank is what you heat up. And the actual coil in the tank is what you put your cold water mains into and the out, out the top it comes out as hot water and the mains pressure. Um, so that's good for your showers and stuff. You don't need any of the uh shower pumps or anything like that we just shower under a um, mains water pressure so we find that the um during the spring summer and autumn we get enough hot water um really quite well um we just find that when we have cloudy days we just plan our showers or baths over onto the sunny days really um now to, to to heat our house during the winter, we have a um, wood burning stove, um, which is actually a German model. And I spent um, days, I think, on the internet trying to find the best one, and I think I found it. So this one's got a um, a thing called a water jacket that's not just on the back of it; it's, it covers all the sides and the top as well. So that's that's good because we've done a very well insulated house, and we find that um, the one kilowatt it puts into the room. And then, it, so it's a 10 kilowatt um, boiler, so it's wood stove. Your, your normal sort of small stoves are about five kilowatts. So this one's twice the si- size of a, a, a small one. And the one kilowatt it puts into the room really does, we've got a, quite a large kitchen diner and that's, it still can get that quite warm if we're not careful. Um, and all the other nine kilowatt goes into that big thermal store that we can run the under, underfloor heating off. Um, uh, but we uh, that thermal store has a couple of um, immersion heaters in it as well just in case we need to use it and we're too lazy at some point not that we've really come to that yet uh. <laughs> laptop's not working <laughs> Aha. So the performance of our house. Uh, th- this was one of the big unknowns I was having when I was trying to design and build the house, where you can get all these U-value calculations, all these SAP calculations, but you still don't know what that means in reality. Um, so we've got a, a better than um, what the, uh, the SAP scouts we, we actually run NG rated B on the SAP scouts because we don't have any uh, actual uh, electric generation they uh, care about. Um, but we find that when it's um, freezing in the, in the mid of winter and we have the house at 20 degrees C, it only drops a couple of C's at degrees C overnight and that's without having any of our underfloor heating on it or anything. Um, and that the solar fed tubes do do a good job of providing our hot water during the March to October. Um, we have a slight worry occasionally in the summer when we've got a few hot days and the, the, the solar pump's pumping away in the tanks, the tube's 110 degrees and the tank's getting to 95 and stuff. But um, it hasn't seemed to cause any problems yet. There's, when you get the solar, your thermal saw at that high, it seems to drop, lose quite a lot overnight anyway. Um, but even the winter, the um, if we put the underfloor heating on and really cool down the, the thermal store, if you get a nice sunny day in the winter, we still get a bit of energy out of it, which is useful. Um, one of the things 
that was on my real big wish list to get the builders installed was uh, the rainwater harvesting system. But they were going to charge me 10 grand for it, um, which seems like a lot for just a tank, a plastic tank in the ground. So about a year after I built it, I mean, well, a couple of years after we moved in, I think, um, I did it myself so that I got them to put the sort of rays all to the same place. I then spent about a thousand pounds on hiring a digger to dig a trench. One of the things we needed is we wanted water into our field anyway. So I put, so I d dug a big trench um, up our, up our hit, hit slope. We're on a bit of the side of the hill. I bought 12 IBCs, which are these big um, thousand litre containers that they ship liquids around the world. So I buried one of those into the ground, covered it in concrete, put a pump with it next to it, and then pumped that up to the field with the, and, and the trench has got everything I can ever think of. And that feeds back to the house and that flushes our toilet and does our washing machine. So that sort of, when I've actually got that up and running, that sort of took two thirds off our water bill. Um, so some of the other tech, I was just, as I'm a geek, I was, I was busy in the early stages trying to get on towards the end of the project it ended up being I just want to get the house finished so I put one wire temperature sensors in all the floors and stuff and in the walls a bit as a maybe I'll automate the house and the heating system but in reality that's probably overkill because we find that one when we pretend they're on the floor heating system a couple of hours later the tank's caught too cold anyway to work anymore without the fire being on so if you have to put the wood burning fire on to actually heat the house and the other problem is the that because the house is so well insulated it doesn't really need that fine control so that's probably a pipe dream that will never get finished but i also put um cat cat5 networking everywhere so every powerpoint in the house has got a cat5 plug socket next to it because i could <laughs> and i've got a um econom econom is a um an open source energy monitoring that I'm sort of setting up now to, to, to control all this stuff. So there's a lot of things that I learned, and this is just a few of them. Um, one of the things that I, in hindsight, I, I maybe could have done would be to put windows in the house, claim it was a house, get a mortgage, and then use that mortgage money to build the house. Because, yeah, without a house there, mortgage you can't get a mortgage. You can get a self-build mortgage, but they're a too expensive and b very quite restricted. Um, and other problems like the the one ton load of hot water tank went into the attic, and I didn't think it really looked strong enough. And the, but I had meeting minutes from with the builders that they said it was strong enough. Then the builders sort of went bankrupt on me, and then. So I went to the timber frame company and said, did you make the roof strong enough to hold the water tank? And they go, no, we weren't told about that. So I'm glad that I, I did keep an eye on everything, but I just wor worried that what would have happened if I wasn't really on the ball. But um, you live and learn. I mean, you, you can watch Grand Designs and there's all sorts of weird or wonderful building stuff on Grand Designs. But if you go and talk to your normal builders, most of them haven't heard of any of them, which is interesting. Um, one of the things I had, one of the, one of the things that I ended up doing was the plot I bought was at auction, which is um, on the day that you're there at the auction, you have to pay over ten percent of the deposit, which is a huge amount of money to write a check out for. And then, yeah, that's when you exchange contracts. So um, you have to be ready. <laughs> and um, yeah, bidding on auctions, good f uh, exercise for your heart. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, so one of the best, I think, things I did do that saves me a load of time was to um, hire a proper professional spray painting machine. The house we built is a four bedroom house with the, the attic space we actually use. So. Uh, made the pitch a bit bigger and it's, you've got a huge attic actually that we haven't actually done much with because we can't afford it but um so that four bedroom house with a huge attic i managed to paint with three colors of with three coats of paint um painting the walls different colors to some extent in a weekend and that yeah because 
you just mask off the windows that you've put in, don't care about everything else really, and just go to town with a spray paint machine. You can you can get a um, sort of rectangular piece of aluminium on a pot on a stick, so you can spray paint your white your white ceiling, and you can hold it in the corner and go and spray your walls. So you get two of you, one holding the, the stick and you, the other one spray painting. Oh, yeah, and as I say, eight rooms or so in a in a weekend, three coats. And my last bit is if you are building an airtight house, is you do need a, a MVHR system, which is a mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. Um, one of the problems with um, we, we, when we first moved in, we weren't quite finished, so we were all sleeping in the living room, and we had serious condensation problems for the first week until I actually got my arse into gear and did the, got the MVHR commissioned, and then the condensation just disappeared. It wasn't an issue anymore. And it also removes the need to have trickle vents on your windows, which is another way you lose heat, and it stops you needing any extractor fans on your bathrooms or your kitchen or anything like that. It's just... and it, it's got a heat exchanger on it, so it, what it does, it takes um, fresh air in from the outside and passes that through the heat exchanger with all the air it's sucking out from your um, moisture rooms here, your kitchens and your bathrooms. So it sucks the warm air out of your kitchens and bathrooms, passes it through the heat exchanger and uses that heat to heat warm up the air coming in. Um, the SAP calculation stuff that says how energy efficient your house is don't seem to like it for some reason because it, it, it uses a small amount of electricity constantly, but it, it removes the need to have any ventilation otherwise, and it's it's one you can control. So um, I believe there's time for questions if anybody has any, or you can always email me and come and find me later. And there's also a um, one of the good things is that in, in Bath, I, I was living in Bristol at the time, in Bath, there's a self-build group set up where it's just a load of other um, people have finding challenges building their own houses. And it's, that I found really good. I think we have time for a question, if it's answered quickly, maybe two. Um, I saw the gentleman here at the back first, so I'm going to hand you the mic. Cool, thank Thanks for your talk. Um, what about internet provision, given that you seem to have picked a random piece of land somewhere outside a village? So it, it may look like a random piece of land. It's actually in a village that's got about 300 houses. And we, we were actually part of the development boundary, so the house sort of formed the corner. So that the house is like on, on the bit of land closest to the village and the house was actually... And when we moved in, um, yeah, I was getting about two and a half meg download speed. Um, but now with the um, Somerset and Devon broadband initiative, they've actually come and put fibre to the cabinet in the village. So I've now got 70 meg, which I'm quite amazed with because I would have thought that was never going to happen. <laughs> Okay, and it's now four o'clock, so if you have any more questions for John, uh, just have them at the side of the stage or outside. Uh, you'll be around all weekend, right? Yeah. Fantastic, cool. Let's put our hands together for John. Thank you very much.